Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I turn one big piece of wood into two very different pieces of wood, and I finally introduce some technology. Before I got started on this project, I didn't even know what I was going to do with this giant slab of map of burl, so I held a poll on my Instagram page, and I just asked, hey, should I cut this up into smaller pieces, or should I try to keep it in one huge piece? And not surprisingly, 75% of the people said to keep it as one big slab, 25% said to cut it up into smaller pieces. So there was no way I was going to let down 25% of my audience, so I decided to cut it up into two smaller pieces. I have really only been woodworking for about six or seven years now, and in the woodworking universe that is not a very long amount of time, but for some reason or another I've had a little bit of success and the pieces I sell now are able to go for a price point that I never expected. And even before I had the YouTube success, I was selling pieces you know, from $5,000 to $30,000, which I will acknowledge is a crazy amount of money and somewhere where I never thought I would be. And at times, it makes me feel like a bit of a fraud. I feel like I'm not doing anything that anybody could do if they just put their mind to it. So in this video, I've kind of outlined a bunch of steps that I've taken that will, I don't want to say trick people, but kind of trick people into thinking that you are a better woodworker than you are. And here's the first step is just buy beautiful wood. And it doesn't always have to be expensive. This slab was expensive. It was about $3,000. But just using beautiful wood is a huge step into convincing people that you're actually a good woodworker when maybe you're still just learning. The wood that I'm using here is called Mappa Burl. And Yes, Mappa Burl is different than Maple Burl. I had someone in my last video mock me because I apparently didn't know how to say the word maple. If you don't know, maple comes from a maple tree. Mappa comes from a poplar tree. They are completely different species. And this one is actually a very soft wood. It's in the hardwood family, but it's soft, and don't get me started on that. Anyway, I am just cleaning out these voids, making sure it is nice and prepped because these voids here are going to get filled with a black epoxy but not a black epoxy like I normally use. I actually have a totally new trick for this. This trick will save you tons of anguish if you work with epoxy at all. And this goes for small voids or large epoxy pores. And that is the liquid dyes that I normally use are really good because they're a very nice, consistent color, but they are incredibly prone to staining your wood, especially softer woods like this. So when I am filling voids like this map of burl here, I am going to be using charcoal as my pigment. Charcoal, believe it or not, does not dissolve in water or in epoxy, and it will not stain the wood at all. But it is jet black, and I mean very, very black. And I haven't used this on a big table yet. I'm tempted to, but still a little bit nervous on doing it on a large scale pour. But for filling these small voids, it is perfect. Like a lot of my builds, I'm going to be putting these C channels in and normally they would go across the short section, but these C channels need to run across the grain. And since this slab is orientated the other way, I'm actually going to need to put two 40 inch long C channels because the grain is running this way, the C channels run this way, and that will hopefully prevent any long term warping or cupping or just a little bit of wood movement that could make this table not perfectly flat. The C channels don't actually make it stronger or anything like that. All they do is prevent a little bit of cupping, a little bit of twisting, and these two C channels should accomplish that. In these videos, I try my best to create the most unique and beautiful pieces that I am physically capable of creating. And some of you may or may not know that I'm not just a YouTuber. I'm also a one man woodworking shop and have been for about as long as I've been woodworking that six or seven years now. And while YouTube now affords me the flexibility to take a chance on kind of a wild piece like this, in the end, everything has to sell to a regular customer because I don't have like a showroom or a big warehouse or anything like that. And my wife has told me we are at carrying capacity on the number of tables I'm allowed to make us. And so while I like things like custom wenge table legs or wild cast aluminum legs that look like some kind of Terminator arm, one of the most common inquiries I get is asking if I can make a sit stand desk. And if you don't know, a sit stand desk is a desk where the height can be adjusted to move from sitting to standing quickly. So I reached out to FlexiSpot to see if they would be interested in sponsoring a video. They said absolutely. I requested their E7 base and it arrived about a week later. Which brings me to my next tip to appear to be a better woodworker, and that is to actually listen to the customers, which is completely different than saying the customer is always right. And 
have a good example of this. When I first started my kind of epoxy table business, I had a customer that reached out and said they wanted a black epoxy with walnut. And I thought that would look ridiculous. I thought the walnut was way too dark. I thought the epoxy would be way too black to go with it, but it was like a thousand dollar sale. And so I was all in. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Whatever you want. After I made it, I was like, this is a beautiful combo. And it eventually became the thing that really kind of launched my YouTube career. And everything since then is the Blacktail signature epoxy table, which is that walnut with black epoxy. And if I would have kind of stuck to my guns or only went with what I thought was best, like the, you know, Wenge table legs opposed to a standing desk, I would have never been to where I'm at today. So getting out of your comfort zone, actually listen to what people say. Sometimes they actually have a good idea. Up until a few months ago, I had very limited experience working with woods that were pretty soft, like this map of Burl and that redwood that you see on the wall behind me. But recently, for some reason, I've been taking on a bunch of these softer wood projects and they are a real pain. If you can avoid it, don't work with any of these woods that are this soft. These are just a nightmare to work with. There's a lot of upside. They can be absolutely beautiful, but they aren't a great beginner project. And this is one of the problems that I found when working with these very soft woods is normally I like to cut the bulk of that chamfer off with the track saw, and then I'll come back and just nip it with this oversized router bit that I had made. However, with this very soft wood, I got a bunch of tear out, which led to way more problems. And that track saw cut was actually much cleaner. So lesson learned on this particular part, but in the end, it's all fixable. Just something I had to learn. My next tip on appearing to be a better woodworker than you actually are is to hemorrhage money on tools. And you know what? I'm only partially joking here. I once heard a professional golfer interviewed and they asked him, they said, hey, what do you think of the amateur golfer that comes out with the $2,000 set of custom clubs? And he's like a 20 handicap. And he said, yeah, he could probably benefit from those custom clubs a lot more than I could and therefore really needs them more than the professional golfer. And the same goes for woodworking is if you are a master carpenter with, you know, 40 years of experience, you could take some Stanley chisels and probably do some incredible work. However, if you are an amateur, you're going to benefit from those nice tools even more so than the professional. And you need to do it responsibly, but everybody has the thing that they're into. They have their own hobby. Some people buy a new car every year. Some people like to go on expensive vacations. Some people even like to like have kids or whatever it is you want to spend your money on, that's fine. And if your thing is nice tools, you don't have to have a certain baseline of woodworking ability before buying those new tools. I say buy them sooner than later. You can see so far, there really hasn't been a ton of woodworking skill involved in this build up to this point. There's been a lot of, you know, having to be meticulous and taking your time and a few tips and tricks to avoid some problems like the staining with the epoxy using that charcoal instead of a liquid dye. And that just comes from experience or watching a lot of YouTube videos. And here I am just kind of smoothing out those burl nubs. And I kind of hate doing this because I love the way they look. But as I mentioned, everything I make has to be really a functional piece in someone's home. And Someone's not gonna be thrilled if their suit or sweater or pants or dog or child gets caught by one of these sharp burl nubs. So I try to keep them as natural looking as I can, but just kind of take the edge off, so to speak. This next part is a part I absolutely anguish over and my wife would absolutely love it. If she didn't work so hard at her job, I would definitely get her doing this. And in the past, I've told people this woodworking tip, and that was to get a wife with OCD, because if you have a wife with OCD, she will come and pick apart every little thing that you do and make sure nothing gets out of your shop that isn't perfection. And whenever I've mentioned that in a video, people always give me a hard time saying that it's very insensitive of me to confuse perfectionism with OCD, which is a psychological disorder. However, you should know that definitions change and adapt to meet society like you may or may not know. The definition of the word literally has literally been changed to also mean not literally. You can look it up, it's kind of interesting. And to that point, the definition of the word OCD has also been expanded to also mean just perfectionism used as an adjective, 
The definition also actually states it is slightly offensive to some people, so at least they got that part right too. While I might not like filling little burl pits, this is a part that I absolutely love. This is the fun stuff for me, getting a little bit experimental with it, taking some inspiration from outside and kind of applying it and really just trying to make it my own. And I'm not saying I invented any part of this. This is something I am really just copying from the guitar makers. This is gonna be similar to a black table I did a few months ago, but what I'm trying on this one is I'm trying to do kind of a, I don't know if it's a sunburst, but a burst where it goes from a really dark on the outside to pretty light in the center, like you see on the PRS guitars. And I reached out to a guy, Coca Guitars, and he gave me some tips. And really what he said is he goes, hey, if you don't like it, just sand it off and add more dye. And so that's what I did. There's no book on how to make a desk out of Mappa Burl this way. So I added a lot of dye. At this point, I didn't like it. It was too dark. It didn't have any fade to it. I thought it would be a little bit better. So I wasn't really discouraged at this point. I just realized, hey, I'm gonna sand it back, add some more dye, and eventually we'll get it right. Because this fade wasn't really turning out the way I'd hoped, I went back and I looked for some more inspiration. I got on the Instagram guitar pages. I got on PRS's website. I found the guitars that I loved, and I saw what they were doing that I wasn't doing very well. And I do this with all my woodworking. This can be another tip for you is, I have a virtual epoxy workshop where we have like three hours of content and we go through every step to make an epoxy table in your home shop or garage. And in one of the first chapters, we discuss how do you choose an amazing layout? And this was sneakily hard for me to learn when I started because not a lot of people were making these tables. So I couldn't really look to inspiration from other people. So what I did is I looked to nature and I saw wow, why does this aerial photo of a river look amazing and my river looks so stupid? And it was using nature as that inspiration and mimicking it that enabled me to do something that other people weren't doing and really kind of separated my tables from others. And in this workshop, we have lots of tips like that. If you want more information on it, there's a link in the description below. And depending on when you're watching this, sometimes I add a bonus in there so you can check out that link and see if it's currently available. What I learned when I went back and looked at those other guitars for inspiration is I wasn't going aggressive enough on my fade and I didn't want the black to kind of light white or natural wood in the center, which I've seen some guitars that do it that way and they're cool in their own right, but wasn't quite the look I was going for. I still wanted kind of a gray silver center. And so what I did was I went really aggressive on sanding that center section back, came back with some lighter dye. And this time you could really see a noticeable fade from that darker edge to the center. This next step is really critical anytime you're doing an epoxy flood coat. And I don't know that my method is the end all best possible method. It's something that's been working for me for a little while now. And that is to seal the wood with thinned out epoxy first. And someone commented in my last video said that you can do it with polyurethane. I've personally tried that and had really bad results. I had a ton of these little micro bubbles and it's not bubbles that come from me not popping them with a torch. It's bubbles that actually are air escaping the wood, something you can't pop with a torch. So what I do now is I take this epoxy, I thin it out a little bit, let as much soak in as possible, and then I just scrape off all the excess and then pop the bubbles like I would normally with a torch. And I actually did two coats of this, and this seems to seal it up really nicely for this epoxy flood coat. I made a couple mistakes during this epoxy top coat. First thing is I brought my food scale out and I thought this would be a good way to measure it. Then halfway through, I realized that the epoxy is a one-to-one -one mix by volume, not by weight, and they weigh different amounts. So I was a little nervous there. The other mistake I made is I had everything ready to be cleaned. I was waiting to wipe the table down until right before the pour, because any dust that settled, I wanted to wipe it off just at the very last moment. And then I forgot to do that once we started rolling with the camera. So as I did this pour, I saw tons of little specks of dust and dirt and hairs in there. And I couldn't figure out why it was so bad until I remembered, oh yeah, I forgot to actually wipe it down. So knew this coat wasn't going to be my last coat. So I had to do at least one more and lesson learned there. I let that top coat cure for a couple days, and while it might look pretty good from this angle, trust me, it is not very nice at this point. And you might think that right now I'm like Bob Ross used to do, when he'd have the painting that looked amazing, and then he'd put a brush stroke right down the middle, and you'd think, Bob, you ruined it. 
and then 10 brush strokes later you're like oh no he totally saved it that looks amazing hopefully i can do the same for this table and i haven't ruined it up to this point and i am making sure to get it perfectly clean i guess this isopropyl alcohol 90 something percent is the best thing to clean these epoxy tables with before you do that next layer and took quite a bit of wiping with these microfibers and this is what i forgot on the last one the tack cloth this is just kind of a sticky cloth that automotive guys use to wipe the piece down just before they spray that finish on there and hopefully at this point i'm clean and ready for the final epoxy top coat every time i do an epoxy top coat i swear i'm never going to do another one and i feel like i've probably said that before in these videos even though i don't specifically remember saying it I just know that I've felt it a lot, and in these commentaries, I tend to say what I'm feeling. So I apologize if that's getting repetitive, and this time I'll finally accept it. This will not be my last epoxy top coat. I know I'll get suckered into do it again because it looks amazing when it's done. There's no substitute for that kind of 3D effect. Although I did just get a spray gun, and I'm really excited to try to learn how to use that because I do not know how to spray at all. I have found, and I bet most of you will agree with this, that one of the best ways to see if a craftsman or woodworker or YouTuber actually likes a tool sponsor is to see if they actually use that tool in their shop. And the same should go for sit-stand desks, apparently, because after seeing this unit in action on this desk, I called them, I requested an additional unit for my personal desk, which I am actually using to do this voiceover right now. The assembly of the desk base was exceptionally easy. It's one of those assemblies you could do without instructions, which is how I feel all assemblies should be, but aren't for some reason. And I love this feature here. It's something I wish I had on more of the bases that I use. You can expand and contract the width of the desk to get the perfect width that you want for your desk. Also, this is pretty interesting. I was gonna use those normal oversized bolts there and drill some larger holes, but they use this really clever rubber grommets that are oversized, so they cut down on vibrations and also give room for seasonal wood movement. So I thought that was pretty clever and actually used their mounting system on this big slab desk. Now that I got the easy part done, it is on to the painfully difficult part of this epoxy top coat. And epoxy is supposed to be self-leveling, but you saw there, this was far from level. There was plenty of waves in it and it has a lot of variables. The environmental conditions, how hot it is, the temperature of the epoxy itself, and just how level and perfect my setup was. And so I wanted a much flatter surface and I've never actually done this before on epoxy. I got a kind of a full size block sander and I was gonna block sand this like they do a car, but block sanding a car is a lot easier because primer sands really nicely, Bondo sands really nicely. Epoxy is horrible. This thing gummed up so bad. I had to clean it out with the vacuum, sand a little bit more, clean it out with the vacuum and it was one of the worst things I've ever done. It was so dusty. I finally, I got this new tool here. I think it's pretty cool. It's like a battery powered ventilator cap thing and it keeps your face actually nice and cool because it's pumping cold air in. I thought that was pretty neat. So got back to work, more block sanding and I spent, I think about six hours this day just doing this. I was physically sore the next day. It was a horrible process, never do this. If you're wondering, I was using 800 grit sandpaper and yes, I could go lower and that would have gone a little faster, but I'm at much higher risk of screwing it up and not getting those scratches out and having some really heavy scratches remain when I was completely finished. And this was dry only sandpaper. It was not to be used wet, but eventually I was just sick of the dust and I said, I don't know, let's see what happens when we use dry sandpaper wet. And you know what? It worked fine. I had to replace it every, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds, but I was having to do that anyway. So use the dry sandpaper wet and you know what? Not so bad. This little lip on the bottom was kind of interesting. It was where the epoxy flowed down over the edge, but kind of just wicked up a little bit on the end and wicked probably isn't the right word, but it just kind of bulged out. So I used my scraper, got it as flat as I could without risk of kind of burning through that epoxy into that black finish or that black dye came back, got it sanded nice and smooth. I tried to stay pretty high grits. I think I didn't go lower than 500. And then eventually started wet sanding up to the 1500 and eventually 3000, which is where I take this top. Some of you might remember a past build where I got all the way finished with a table and that's sanding through 3000 grit and then stage one compound and then stage two compound where I saw some deep scratches that were left in the epoxy, probably from the 600 grit sanding. And 
I was devastated. That was so much lost time. So this time wasn't going to happen to me. I was so paranoid. So even though I was block sanding with 800 grit, I went with 600 grit here, took several discs, sanded one direction, came back, sanded the other direction with 600 grit again, did the same thing with 800 grit, did the same thing with 1000 grit. Now I am wet sanding with 1500 grit. This is the 3M Trizac, and this should keep me safe, hopefully. If you can appreciate or at least respect the fact that I don't bombard you early in the video before I've actually shown you anything, asking you to like, subscribe, all those things, which by the way, I am convinced that likes don't actually do anything. You can actually keep your like or even thumbs down this video if you want. I don't think it makes any difference. What does make a big difference though is the subscriptions. And if you think that I've earned your subscription, if you've enjoyed this video, if you wanna see more videos like it, I would genuinely appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. Another tip I can give you that will not only help trick people into thinking you're a better woodworker than you are, but will actually genuinely make you a better woodworker is don't be afraid for your projects to end up in the dumpster. You have no idea how many of my projects I've just thrown away. They just ended up stupid. I didn't like them, threw them away. But every now and again, I get lucky. I did this burnt wood and epoxy table several years ago. It's still my most viewed YouTube video. It's like 25 million views, which is pretty crazy. I actually have another video kind of similar to that coming up. I was positive. I told my video guy, I'm like, I give this a 10% chance of success and somehow it actually worked and it's pretty freaking cool. Speaking of wanting to throw things in the dumpster, yes, I screwed up with my sanding once again. I did not sand well enough. So this is kind of a Hail Mary. I'm going with my extremely heavy cut compound and my wool bonnet, which is supposedly a much more aggressive bonnet. And at this point, I'm planning on having to sand all the way down just like I did last time, but figured I would at least give it one shot here. Oh, I think I got lucky. As I'm editing this, I realize you guys really don't get to see happy cam very often. It always seems to be a string of mistakes and me just kind of looking on in anguish. But believe it or not, I do get happy. And that was one of the moments that I was actually pretty thrilled. That heavy cut and that wool bonnet actually took those scratches out. It was pretty amazing. Here's a side by side of before and after. So pretty much dodged a bullet there and was rather excited and not afraid to smile for once. That experience reminds me of another tip I can give you to trick people into thinking you're a better woodworker than you are, and that's just to care more than the next guy or gal. There are so many people out there that are much more skilled that wouldn't have made a mistake that big, but maybe the mistake they did make, they just wanted that piece out the door. Maybe they got bills to pay, maybe they got a production schedule to meet, and they just send it out anyway, even though they have more skills than me. And that's probably the most impactful tip I can give you out of all these is just keep trying, care enough to make it right, and it will really separate you from a staggering amount of more talented woodworkers. I make a lot of jokes about the negative feedback I get in my comment section by a very, very small minority of people because for the most part, I think it's pretty funny, but one of the most helpful groups out there is the automotive guys. I have gotten so many amazing buffing and polishing tricks from those guys that I would have never been able to do this table. So big thanks to all those tips I've gotten from you guys. When you're designing any table, I have found that you want either a statement top or a statement base, but not both on the same piece. Meaning if you have a highly figured wood top, you don't really want highly figured wood legs. And that is one reason I love this base with this top. The E7 is just clean and simple. It doesn't distract from the top at all. It's also incredibly sturdy. It's rated for up to 355 pounds and that feels conservative. They even offer a 15 year warranty which goes to the durability and stability of the base. FlexiSpot is also offering my viewers early Tech Day pricing with a link in the description. And if you don't know what Tech Day is, it's basically Black Friday, but without the bad weather and crowds. Any piece that is this level of gloss is gonna be extremely prone to scratching. And so I have one final barrier of protection and that is this ceramic coating. And again, this is something from the automotive industry. Although this one is by Black Forest Wood Co. This was actually designed for wood furniture and it's a two part system. This is the base coat that's going on here. And this is basically the next generation of wax where you used to wax your car, now you ceramic coat it and it lasts for years. And I literally mean ceramic coat lasts for years on a car outside. This is the top coat. As I understand it, it wears a little bit better. So 
as your table is worn, you can add another coat of the top coat and it tends to just not scratch as easily as the base coat, but the base coat is a little bit more protective as I understand it. Anyway, here is the final result. If you want to bid on it, the auction is live now. It'll run for a week, no reserve, starting at $1. Every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week we'll keep it simple. These are both desks from the same slab of wood. So start your question or comment with the words light or dark and that way I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video. Thank you so much. Have a great week.